reaction into the police, why they were overwhelmed, and why did they open the fatal gate. Good evening. The police tonight started to name the fans who were crushed to death in the Hillsborough disaster yesterday. They identified 24 of the 94 known to have died, a list that included a 10-year-old boy, two sisters and nine teenagers. Most were from Liverpool. The club has suspended its fixtures. The Football Association will meet to decide whether to call off this year's FA Cup. There'll be at least two investigations into what happened, a formal public inquiry ordered by the government and a parallel investigation into the conduct of the police, who've been defending their actions today in the face of mounting criticism. Mrs Thatcher has visited the 47 injured still in hospital in Sheffield and promised half a million pounds to an appeal fund. The Prince and Princess of Wales will go there tomorrow. The crowds have been making their way to Hillsborough again today, many fewer and in an altogether different mood from that of yesterday afternoon. They came to lay flowers at the gate to the North Stand. Many were fans who survived the disaster. But many were Sheffield families, anxious to share in the grief in the morning. Some of the young Liverpool supporters were still talking of the disaster and of their personal dramas. Two young kids, one of them got pressed up against our oh, Barry, about a five-year-old one of kids. Got pressed up against Barry and all his face put up, so, of course, I had to bust bit anyway. Got up, pulled him up and helped him off. I just slung him off. I couldn't, couldn't do nothing else, I just slung him off to coppers. In the city's Roman Catholic Cathedral, where a special requiem mass was celebrated, the cathedral administrator spoke of Sheffield waking up and hoping that yesterday was all a bad dream. But for some of the mourners, the occasion was too much, and one slipped away from the service. In Sheffield's Anglican Cathedral, hundreds of mourners gathered this evening for a service of prayers, a tribute from many who were not devout soccer fans to those who were, and died following their adored team. The Bishop of Sheffield, while not wanting to apportion blame, declared, but yet what an absurdity it is that we bring 50,000, 100,000 or whatever people together in so haphazard a way, somehow are failing to realize that human beings are very vulnerable to the accidental or deliberate actions of each other. It was just before lunchtime that the Prime Minister arrived at Hillsborough, accompanied by the Home Secretary, Douglas Hurd, and Sports Minister Colin Moynihan. Mrs Thatcher, looking pale and distressed, was taken round the terrace where barriers had buckled under the weight of thousands of Liverpool supporters. <coughs> Mrs Thatcher saw the tragedy in terms of the loss to families. All of a sudden, there's a big hole and a big emptiness, an enormous hole, and nothing can fill it. And we just have to gather round and be there and be with them. Comfort is the least one can do, but it doesn't fill the big void of emptiness that is there. Nothing can fill that. This afternoon, leaders of the local authorities of Sheffield, Liverpool and Nottingham came together in Sheffield City Hall to launch a joint That's appeal fund. Each authority pledged £25,000 to the fund. The leader of Liverpool City Council felt the distress personally. I was at the match yesterday and saw firsthand the, the tragedy before my eyes. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. That numbness is still with me. And I'm finding it very difficult to express my feelings today. As they met, South Yorkshire police were preparing to lease the first 25 names of those who died at Hillsborough. The police list included eight teenagers, two of them sisters. The youngest was a boy of 10. Delayed for nearly an hour, the police press conference was limited to announcing the setting up of an inquiry under the Chief Constable of the West Midlands. Senior South Yorkshire officers, in the absence of their own Chief Constable, declined to discuss the policing of yesterday's match and left at once. But for those who felt closest to the game, to the families, 
and to the Liverpool club itself, there was the simple shrine of scarves and flowers decorating the gates through which excited loved ones had passed yesterday. A day that promised so much good and left so much grief. And Liverpool has been in mourning today. This evening, thousands of people made their way to the Metropolitan Cathedral to offer prayers for those who died and their families. The Catholic Cathedral this evening filled to overflowing. A requiem mass which brought together the people of the city. From many denominations, councillors and MPs, representatives of all kinds of organisations and societies. But above all, the footballers, their supporters, their families and friends, and all those in Liverpool who so love and value the game. The Mass was celebrated by the Archbishop, Derek Warlock, who was joined by David Shepherd from the Anglican Cathedral. The strength and the demonstration of the city's emotion was evident. It is a great tribute to the whole of this city, to its commitment to the great sport of football, but most of all, of love amongst good friends. All day, the city had been quiet, and many will have kept their grief to themselves. This evening, though, thousands wanted just to be part of a massive crowd stretching far around the cathedral, with an altar for individual gestures from the fans. This was repeated at the team's home at Anfield. From first light, there were flowers and messages, scarves and little prayers. During the night, flowers had even been thrown over the high walls. Everton supporters joined their Liverpool rivals, while inside, club officials met. We have resolved to make an immediate contribution of £100,000 to open a charitable fund for the relief of the families of the victims and the injured. In the meantime, it is our view that all football matches involving the club should be suspended for the time being. The plainness of the statement contrasted with the colour of emotion on the Anfield pitch. Thousands making their way to the COP. Tragic, isn't it? You know, everyone's devastated. They've all got somebody that they, you know, that they know or belong to. When I'm an Evertonian, and it, you know, it's um, it's just devastating. I, I I really don't know. It's just it's just a devastating. Uh, it, it kills us all, doesn't it? It went on all day with the goal and the most famous of terraces covered with tributes. One for the youngest victim so far identified, a 10-year-old boy. Across the city, a sound only rarely heard this century on the death of a monarch. The bell of Great George, which was rung after the Heysel disaster and which was tolled yet again today for the dead at a football match. Forty-seven people are still in two hospitals in Sheffield, the Northern General and the Royal Hallamshire. The Prime Minister spent most of the afternoon touring the hospitals, where 17 fans are in intensive care. They'd escaped, bruised and battered, but they'd escaped. And with relieved relatives at their bedside, they told of their desperate panic as they struggled to survive, and of those who didn't. When I got outside, I was lying on the floor and there was some fella lying on the floor next to me shaking and he asked me could I hold his head 
and I was holding his head. The doctors were running backward and forward to him, shouting, get him an ambulance. And in the meantime, he said to me, he just looked at me and said, help me, and he died in my arms. They told two of those who fought to help them, the concern of the opposing fans. He stayed with me all the way through. He got me into the sports hall. He was like trying to get me, my hands were in spasms, and he was like, he was brilliant. He was trying to get me to open my hands and squeeze. And he was there saying, I'm a nuts for this lad. I want you to pull through. He's really backing me up and everything. It was, it was just brilliant. The vigil goes on tonight for the patients at the two hospitals who are in intensive care. Some have suffered head, chest and internal injuries from being crushed or trampled underfoot. Most need ventilators to breathe still and doctors say it's impossible to know whether they'll suffer permanent brain damage. The Prime Minister stayed long over schedule touring both hospitals. Doctors, nurses, all the staff had been wonderful, she said. And she stopped at the bedside of all the fans fit enough to meet her. I have been listening to them and it's good for some of them to talk about it. And for some of them, some of them who are patients in this hospital, turned and gave a resuscitation, a mouth to mouth resuscitation, before they themselves were, were overtaken by losing consciousness. What is your... So it is really a story in the midst of tragedy of tremendous heroic courage. But some of the fans had hard words to say on the organisation at the game. They were angry with those who they said had given Liverpool too few tickets, put them at the wrong end of the ground and then opened the gates to disaster. Their own club, they said, coped with similar crowds most weeks. I've been in, the, in Anfield's grounds in the cop half an hour before kick-off and the, the place is deserted. Like, and there's 40,000 got in there by half seven, so... I mean, if, you, if they can't control, like, to get a few thousand in it, 20 minutes before kick-off, well, that's not our problem, is it? It doesn't happen at Anfield. No, everyone gets in. I didn't even use my ticket, and I've still got it, and I bet you there's plenty that still have got the tickets unused. Do you think that's wrong? Well, I think it is wrong, yeah. Because it's obvious that people without tickets have gone in as well. It should never have happened, anything like that. It was... There was just too many people, those trying to get out. There was only two gates, one or two gates where we could get out. There was nothing like that should have ever happened. It was just badly organised as far as I can see. There was... No. The task of identifying the victims of the tragedy has been going on all day. Police say they now know the identity of all but six of the 94 dead. 24 have been positively identified by relatives. Among those who died on soccer's blackest day were many lifelong Liverpool fans. Many had saved money specially for the trip. They included a 10-year-old, John Gilhooley, from Highton near Liverpool, the youngest of the victims so far named. Teenage sisters Sarah and Victoria Hicks from Middlesex also died. Their parents were at the game and father Trevor Hicks tried unsuccessfully to save his daughters. Of the 24 positively identified by relatives, the majority were less than 30 years of age. Half of them were from Merseyside. The oldest victim named so far is John Anderson from Liverpool. He was 62 and at the match with his 32-year-old son who survived the tragedy. The investigation into the cause of the disaster is now underway, but there have already been calls for changes in the design of football grounds, in particular the use of steel fencing to prevent supporters getting onto the pitch. And some MPs have said government proposals to introduce identity cards for football supporters shouldn't go ahead until the findings of an inquiry into the Hillsborough disaster are known. Over the coming weeks and months, inquiries will be exhaustive into the combination of circumstances and decisions which led to so many deaths. Liverpool fans have complained angrily that their better supported club got fewer tickets and a smaller stand. Many travelled without tickets, adding to pressure outside the ground. Ten minutes before kick-off, police believed people here could be injured or killed. So a senior officer ordered a gate into the ground to be opened. The crowd surged through a tunnel under the stand into the central sections of the terracing. They were crushed forward and down onto the perimeter fence. The central area was already packed, although there was space in the sections at each side.
instead of dispersing to the wings of the terrace, you know, where the corner flags are, where there was plenty of room and half a dozen empty steps, because the game had started, they all ran to the entrance behind the goal. Then they start pushing downwards and people inside can't move sideways. When this happened to us as kids in the olden days, you elbowed your way sideways towards the corner flag to get out of the crush. Now with the barriers and the penning, they can't do that. So they're really trapped and, and squashed. Questions now facing the South Yorkshire police are whether they had enough officers at the Leppings Lane end to handle the situation which built up. Then, having decided to open the gate, why weren't people directed to areas of the terraces where there was still space? Many of the victims were crushed against the perimeter fence, put up, as at other major grounds, to prevent pitch invasions, but Hillsborough yesterday, it stopped fans escaping. They had to squeeze through the access gates or get out by whatever means they could. Those who foresaw the danger of fences want them removed. Primitive fencing had been the product of obsession with a hooliganism as distinct from concern with safety. And I think yesterday we saw the end of the perimeter fence and the terrible things it does when the pressures on it become unbearable. Football may look at this type of fence in use in France, which opens completely if people need to get out of the stands in a hurry. The public inquiry will also consider closely the response of the emergency services at Hillsborough. They worked under desperate pressure and with a shortage of equipment. Advertising boards had to be used as makeshift stretchers. A doctor who was at the match as a spectator, but then helped in the emergency operation, described it as total chaos. The whole thing from beginning to end um, had incompetence running right through it, the organisational arrangements. And I think that it's time we started to ask questions about accountability of some of the senior officers in the FA and the minister himself, of these people who are supposed to be responsible, uh, who are quite happy to take the credit and the glory of senior positions, but won't accept the responsibility when things go wrong. Professional football will once again undergo a searching examination of its future as a spectator sport. There's little doubt major changes will be demanded, among them all-seater football grounds. The sooner, the quicker more seats are put in and fans' preferences are shifted from standing to sitting, the better that will be for the future of the game. Under the proposed football supporters bill, all fans would have to carry identity cards. Critics have predicted the scheme could cause just the sort of problem which confronted police at Hillsborough. Even government supporters are now saying the measures need to be looked at again. I think that part of the legislation that relates to uh, British people going overseas must continue and would enjoy all party support. That part that relates to the United Kingdom I think should now be suspended whilst we rethink very fundamental questions. Put it on ice. Uh, yes. It's up to the public inquiry to analyse the full, appalling story of Hillsborough. Every inch of the Leppings Lane end will be examined to identify the causes and see what more must be done to protect crowds at sporting events. And lessons about improving safety at British soccer grounds after yesterday's tragedy will be learned in part from the example of European clubs. Their techniques for crowd control differ in many ways. The European style was demonstrated to good effect in Holland today for the first division game between Ajax and Feyenoord. 400 extra police were brought in to control the crowds at the highly charged encounter between two of Holland's leading clubs. Most were able to enjoy the match in peace. The techniques used at the stadium are commonplace in Europe. A fire break of about 100 yards between rival supporters wide gangways at the front of the stands to stop fans being pressed against the fences. Where the crowd was thickest, the police took down a section of fencing to allow access. Here, unlike in Britain, all the tickets sold are for seats. There is no standing room. And there was no question of those without tickets being allowed into the ground. After Ajax's victory, a cordon of police divided the rival fans. Those who tried to break it were quickly dealt with. There were some injuries and arrests, but the Feyenoord supporters were shepherded to the railway station without a major incident. In the world of European football, there's widespread shock at what happened at Sheffield yesterday. There are also new doubts being voiced about the wisdom of allowing English clubs back into the European fold. Edward Sturton, BBC News, 
Amsterdam. Here, the Hillsborough disaster cast a shadow over what was to have been a celebration dinner for the country's top footballers in London tonight. As members of the Professional Footballers Association gathered at the Hilton Hotel for their annual awards night, those who run the game were considering whether this season's FA Cup should be abandoned altogether. This was scheduled as football's major showpiece celebration. Players from all over the country were here to present their award to the season's outstanding player. But English football has never had less to celebrate. The mood was sombre, with a minute's silence observed in tribute to the dead. There were also prayers for the victims. We pray that your peace may bring comfort to those who grieve. Some had wanted this dinner cancelled, but the organisers went ahead, worried that all the guests couldn't be notified in time. We feel so much uh, sorry for the, for the relatives who have lost loved ones. I mean, it's, yeah, that's a tremendous loss. And if we can do anything in help of, of them, then uh, I'm sure the people at Forest and myself will, will do as much as possible. Earlier, the FA talked about the future of this year's cup competition. A decision on whether to cancel it will be made either tomorrow or Tuesday. But it's clear the FA would like to continue with the competition, if at all possible. I would much rather um, find a fitting way of commemorating those who died yesterday within the context of continuing the competition and playing the match uh, to a conclusion and playing the final and the competition to a conclusion. And There's certainly no appetite for football at Liverpool's ground Anfield at the moment. Wednesday's match against West Ham has already been postponed and Sunday's televised game against Arsenal is also extremely unlikely to go ahead. And among the rest of the day's news, in Beirut, the Spanish ambassador and two members of his family have been killed in the latest clashes between the Syrian and Lebanese army forces. They fired an estimated 15,000 shells and rockets at each other. At least 22 other people were killed in the barrage, which lasted 18 hours. Israeli troops are reported to have shot and killed three Palestinians, including a 10-year-old boy in the occupied territories. Clashes erupted between police and villagers in many areas. Protesters defied the military curfew imposed on the day the Palestinians commemorated the first anniversary of the killing of Abu Jihad, the PLO's military commander. Here, police in Birmingham are hunting for the killer of 30-year-old police constable Anthony Salt, who was found dead in a side street in the east of the city early this morning. West Midlands police believe muggers may have attacked PC Salt, who was on plainclothes surveillance duty. He was married with three young children. And that's the news tonight, after a weekend dominated by the tragedy at Hillsborough. Yesterday, 94 soccer fans were crushed to death. Today at the COP, witness to so many of Liverpool's triumphs, homage to the dead of British sport's worst disaster. From the BBC Newsroom, good night. Hello. The West Country has had over an inch of rain in the last 40 days.